His, his question is, how do you build a career playing bass? And do you want to read out his question? Yeah, so Sean's been playing since 2003 and he really wants to play professionally. Um, and he knows that, you know, getting there is going to take a few steps and he wants to break those down. He's living in Singapore, but he might well move if that's going to help the process. He's married, but he doesn't have kids. Um, and he's got a kind of day job going to, you know, keep things... Uh, you know, keep things going money-wise. Um, but he's got four questions, and he wants to know about the routes that you go to become a professional bass player because of many different types of professional player. Yeah. Um, how would you go about deciding which one's right for you? He wants to know about the music school, whether it's worth going or not, and if uh, basically any advice we have on how he can make a trans- the transition to becoming a professional player. So let's start okay. at the beginning. What are the possible routes? When you think about a professional player, Scott, let's give us some examples of people who are professional and, and the type of role that they play okay. in the music industry. Um, so the word professional just means you make your living mm. or the lion's share of your living from, mm. from playing an instrument, right? Mm. So, yeah. um, so you could be a freelancer or hypothetically you could be in a famous band yeah he's you, a pro bass player yeah um so you could be in Trevor Barry, uh, yeah you know. yeah yeah absolutely flea's a pro bass player and so is marcus miller and so yeah. it so it, are you yeah yeah you know and so you know what i mean so there's it's sort of like right across the board what i would say is that anybody who is thinking about becoming a pro player um the the what the one the the path that is more most controllable f- f- from your standpoint is being a freelancer. Yeah. Okay. Now this you might think, what's a freelancer mean? It's what is was commonly called a session player. Mm. You know, if somebody's like, a, I'm going to be a session musician. Mm. Well, session musicians don't really exist anymore in the yeah. in the general in the general field. People of don't make a living full time playing at recording sessions. It yeah. just doesn't. Happen. It doesn't I, exist I don't anymore. Know anybody who's ever who does that now? Yeah. Certainly, you know, fifty years ago, thirty years ago, you know, it was happening. And there are people who make money from recording sessions, but not as a full time thing. Absolutely. I like yeah. back in the day, a, a, a drummer, a London drummer's come into mind. Yeah. He used to have, um, he used to have a, a diary, mm. not a, a written diary. He used to have a diary, as in a person that used to work for his diary. Yeah, and then he'd let Ian know where his sessions were that day, and mm. he would drive around London to his sessions. And at any one time, he had three drum sets mm. moving round the 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 different studios in London, and he'd be following them. So he'd have sort of like a guy there setting his kit up he'd get to the studio he'd do the session while he was doing that session there's another drum kit being moved from one studio to the other via you know with his drum tech and he'd set that you know Mm. and that's what that was the the landscape back then that doesn't really exist now um i'm sure it does for the very very few like you know no point not 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 one percent even those guys i I still don't think they'll be doing it full time i don't think they'll be getting up like james jameson was and working at recording studio all day i mean you might get people like i mean obviously mark marcus miller is one we think about but you know he's working as a producer he's i mean think about the amount of live performance work he's doing how many times is he actually walking into a studio and playing a jingle you know and it's that kind of work that really you know session you know yeah yeah. like abe laboriel is another one that was just sort of like he was the 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 session player of the moment you know? Nathan East I mean there's still these guys that are absolutely the top of, and yeah. you know Steve Gadd yeah, yeah but they're not they're not getting up Monday to Friday going into the recording studio Working like they were even anymore. though though those guys have done that in the past you yeah, know? yeah. Um, so to bring it back to what I was talking about generally that session musician now is what you would refer to as a freelancer you're yeah. a freelancing musician and when I said I said there's two kind of routes one is not very controllable by you yeah. i.e. I'm going to be in a famous band then you sort yeah. of like you join a band and you try and make it and you either try and be self-published or hook up with the record label and then publish it yourself or whatever you do. You and know. that's a great option. It's a great I, option, but know. it's not very controllable from an individual yeah. standpoint. So for me, if I wanted to be, a, if I, you know, obviously I'm a professional musician, but if I, if I was back in the day, I was thinking to myself, I want to be a professional musician, which I've been through, Yeah, you know, I might as well yeah, add yeah. that in there, you yeah. know, and you've been yeah. through this, you know, we at one point made the decision, okay, we want to do this as a living. Um, when we did that, like for me, it was definitely, I'm going to be a freelancer. Mm. You know, I don't, it'd be great if I ended up in a, in a famous band. Great. You know, yeah, but, yeah. but you know, let's do something that's really controllable. I'm going to be a freelancer. So once you've made that decision, then you need to start thinking about the, the different skill sets that you need to have to fulfill that role as a freelancer musician. Right. So there's a particular, bunch of skill sets 
if you're going to work as a, a freelance musician and be really busy and be really employable, you absolutely have to have. So, for instance, you absolutely have to have a really great understanding of how to play bass lines for multiple genres of music. Mm. Because you're going to turn up and it might be, hey, we're doing this thing, oh, and we're going to do this tune, and we're going to do like a reggae vibe on it. Mm. You absolutely need to know how to recreate. You know, you don't have to be a reggae master or a jazz mm. master, mm. but you absolutely have to take care of business in multiple styles of music. So rock, metal, jazz, country, mm. uh, pop, mm. R&B, uh, Motown, soul star. Mm. Do you know what I mean, you need to have them down and be really confident at being, being able to, to play those styles um, within, you know, with your bass lines. Um, something else I would say that you would absolutely have to do is have a, a repertoire mm. of tunes. You know, obviously when you start out, you might not have that, but it's something that always to sort of like keep an eye on. Like you should have like a repertoire or the busy guys are mm. going to have you know, a repertoire. So they will know, like everybody talks about jazz standards, but there is there are, there are, there are pop standards. Mm. There are R&B standards. You know, you yeah. need to be able to know how to play um, My Girl. You yeah. need to be know, able to know how to play I Want You Back. Yeah, you Sir need Duke, to be able or... to know Sir Duke, Blame It On The Boogie. Yeah. All of those sort of like pop style standards, you need to be able to play them. If you want to do that work. If so you if, want to be a really you, busy if, freelancer. Exactly. But if you also, there's different types within that. There were guys like Lawrence Cottle, he'll be, he'll be really deep into the jazz scene. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, there were other people out there who were doing like, you know, a lot of function work, which is playing at people's weddings, corporate events, that kind of party bands. Yeah. And, and those guys are really going to need to know the pop repertoire really well. You know, I mean, were, but, but as you say, to be a, a true freelancer where you're doing all sorts, yeah. then you've got to kind of have that. Lawrence Cottle's a great example, okay? Yeah. So he's a jazz monster. Yeah, absolute you know, master. He's sort of like an absolute master. Mm. Uh, he also plays with Deep Purple. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. he plays with Deep Purple, right? Mm. Like Pino, great, like he played with D'Angelo, he's played with The Who. Yeah, you know? Yeah. Like, it's just, that's just, the, it's part of it that you need to understand that you need to have that stuff down and you need to, you need to be able to always listen to different styles of music and get it into your playing. Um, just going on to what you mm. were saying there, I suppose sort of like a particular, just stop me if you think I'm, no, I'm pushing over no. sort of like what we want to talk about here. But at some point you'll be there if you do want to become a prof- professional musician and you'll be thinking, how do I actually get a pro gig and what type mm. of pro gig do I need to do? Because there's corporate gigs where you'll be doing weddings and business events mm. and stuff like mm. that. There's cruise ships, mm. there's jazz like restaurant well there's jazz gigs but then there's like restaurant gigs and 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 show work there's show work in theatres there's touring shows that you could go on there's like a a ton of different paths okay I'm just going to sort of like generalise massively here okay and just if I rewind the clock for me Mm. and I was thinking okay I want to be a professional musician what I do is really try and get in on the corporate scene to start with I think it's a really it's a it's, it's benefit. It's, it's, it's a great way to get experience. It pays good. Yeah. So it's going to give you the it's going to give you the opportunity to take your foot off the gas if you've got a day mm. job. Mm. Okay. So um yeah, so I like for me personally I, I would have thought and, and I did that actually, mm. you know, I did sort of like end up doing a lot of corporate stuff to start with. And the main thing here is you learn a great repertoire as well mm. because a lot of the time you are playing some jazz stuff as well for the earlier dinner stuff if yeah. you're doing that. And then you'll go on, you'll play all the pop standards, all the Motown stuff. and So it'll it'll nail that down and get it into your playing so you become a really well-rounded player. And and at the same time, as I said, it pays decent. So you job can, you to know. jump between those bands because I've always done freelancing but for lots of different bands. So like, and to go in and sit in and play somebody's set that you don't know and then, you know, then play someone else's the next night and yeah. everything is slightly different. There are, everything's in different keys. There are different arrangements. But you're right, there's a core bunch of songs that are kind of really at the heart of what people are playing at the moment um, that you want to make sure you get on board. Valerie. Yeah, yeah, well, absolutely, <laughs> well, like, yeah. Like the yeah. Amy Winehouse version, you know. Like, yeah, Sweet Home Alabama or something. I don't know, whatever. Just, like, all, Mustang you know, Sally. Yeah, so Duke and we were saying earlier. Um, there were other things as well. What about in terms of skills like sight reading, Scott? What sort of value do you place on that as a freelancer? Does everybody have to sight read, you know? Everybody doesn't have to sight read, yeah. but I suppose the question should be, it shouldn't be... Does everybody have to sight read? The yeah. question should actually be, 
Is it going to help you get gigs if and get you can read? And make money. Yeah. Yeah. I right. Think- so if you want to be a professional musician, is reading going to help you get gigs? We're not even going to mm. go further down. All I yeah, want to yeah, do is yeah. pose that question to you guys and you can answer that on your own. I'm sure you know, you know, what, what I'm pointing at there. You know, reading isn't for everybody. Yeah. If, you know, like Gary Willis doesn't read that. You know, yeah, I think yeah. he has basic reading skills, but he's not sort of yeah, like... Yeah, Pino you know, or, you know... Like, yeah, Pino doesn't read. Paul yeah, Turner. yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know, actually. I don't think I'm Paul Turner sure reads. Paul. Like, all of them will read yeah. charts, right? So reading charts is, a, yeah, is, so you, is an absolute... You need to be able to read You've got to be able to create baselines as well. That's the other thing, is that whether yeah. you understand it... How, how you understand it doesn't really matter. You could be playing completely by ear, yeah. or you could have a really in-depth sort of knowledge of harmony, maybe, probably, by studying jazz. That's probably what's going to give you that. Yeah. Um, but whether you know whether you're doing that or not, you're going to need to be able to create your own baselines over chord sequences, and to be able to read chord charts. I mean, like your recent course on reading chord charts is kind of everybody who wants to be a freelance player would have to be able to do the material covered in that. Yeah. If you are an academy member, make sure yeah. you check out the, uh, the that that course that we created. Was it last month? Mm. Yeah, last month, where I yeah. go into you know reading reading charts. You know, because mm. that is something that everybody really needs to be able to do. Um, and it's going to be hugely beneficial. So that's not reading music, it's reading charts, so reading, you know, understanding what chord symbols are and stuff like that and how that translates to bass and what you do with that information. That's really, really important. So I'm, trying, I'm trying to think Sean's, of... Okay, so oh, imagine... I'm just going to go God. on... A, I'm, I'm going on a flow here. So oh, imagine... No. I'm on, oh, no, oh, no, he's on a flow. So imagine we, we, we've, we've covered what a freelancer is, we've covered some of the, some of the, the skill set of what you're going to need. Yeah, yeah. How do you get the gigs... So we've spoken about this before in various videos where the, the, it's everything is networking. Every gig that you get will be on the recommendation from someone else. People won't just be, you know, certainly the good work. People aren't just going to be randomly ringing around people. They're going to ask someone and they're going to say, Scott is a great player, give him a call, here's his number. I mean, that's how we met through networking and all yeah. of the, you know, every gig that I've got. Also, pretty much every teaching job I've got has been through networking as well. So you want to be interacting with the other musicians and the way that you find those. Typically, we've, we've both spoken about this, about getting together and having private lessons with the best sort of freelance players in the town. That you're in, in the area that you are. absolutely a great way to do it. They need to hear you play. They need to be able to say that, that you can do the job, you know. Yeah. Um, and just ringing them up or sending them a text message saying, hey, I'm you. Would you? It's not going to do it. It's not going to You're only going to recommend people that you've actually worked with before. But to get there, you've got to be going to jam sessions. You've got to be getting in with the local teacher so they can hear you play. Um, and also so you can learn as well. I mean, you know, that's why we're, that's what we're all doing this for. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, getting down to the local gigs where big artists are playing. I mean, if Marcus Miller was coming to Leeds, for example, we both live in Leeds in the UK. If Marcus Miller came down, every local bass player would be there. Yeah, all you know? the, yeah, yeah. So like, yeah. you know, we go to those gigs and then we hang yeah. out with all the players. And there's a great community of local bass players in everywhere I've been to. Bass players generally get on really well. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, you can We're get a good bunch out. Yeah, even down to the audition circuit. Like, I've taken auditions for gigs, but they've all been off recommendations where I've been asked to take an audition. Yeah. And I'm not saying that you can't find the odd thing in a magazine or online or whatever. Sure, you can. Uh, but you know, the key to make go forward quickly is other people. What, what are your thoughts, Scott? Same, man. I think sort of like a really great mindset, or just something mm. to keep in mind is the lion's share of gigs you're going to get through your career, the yeah. lion's share of it will be from other bass players. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> right. really true, yeah. So having a relationship with other bass players is super, super important. Where if you're in a town, mm. figure out who are the top four guys that are getting all the gigs. Because in Leeds, it is, I would say... Yeah, yeah. You know, there's four or five guys that get, you know, all the gigs. Book some lessons with them and start creating a relationship with them. You know, I was talking to Todd Johnson the mm. other day on the mm. Sunday roast that we did. We did a live stream on Sunday. And he said when he first moved to Phoenix, he said he found out who the top bass players are. And he mm. said, and if he wasn't getting a lesson from them, he yeah. said he was taking them to dinner. Yeah, yeah, sure. One yeah. of the two. Yeah. You know, yeah. he said if, the, if he's not taking them to dinner, he's going for a lesson. He's or going interacting to with them on with social them. media, hanging out with them, you know, reaching out. When I, I've moved to a new town before and I reached out to a lot of people at the time and just made contacts. I still yeah. use today. Um, just, the, you know, and, and then going down to the jam sessions and, um, you know, um, and making that, that's a really important thing to do. Um, because, when, and it's, yeah. so, sorry oh. to win, but when you're playing, when, if you're in a lesson, now, just going back to Todd, actually, mm. let's just sort of like give you a bit of a... Um, I want to frame this because people might not know who Todd is mm. or they might not know what level he... When he moved mm. to Phoenix, what level he was at. So just to give you a little bit of a backstory, Todd was one of the busiest 
bass players in Las Vegas. Mm. He was doing all the shows and all that, right? And then he decided to leave there and go back to college, to music mm. school, and went to MI in LA, Musicians Institute. Went there, did the, did the thing, mm. and ended up teaching at MI there. Okay, so let's yeah. just sort of like assume that he's got his stuff down, right? Mm. <laughs> he's a good player. Then moved to Phoenix. Then he's on the blower. Then he's calling ba- the, the the popular bass players mm. in the busy bass players in that area up for yeah. lessons mm. to take them for dinner or whatever it was. It's not you know you don't get to a point where you can't learn anything. So you know see that that lesson if you're really really skilled and stuff. You know I can learn stuff from anybody. Mm. You know it's don't be oh you know I don't want to get lessons because I'm sort of like past it or whatever. You know call them up for a lesson and then you can start building a relationship with with those guys. Absolutely, what will happen is if your skills are up to scratch, you know, the next time they get a gig where they can't do it and their sub or their dep mm. can't do it, is busy, you know, they'll be like, oh, you know, Jeff's a great guy. I'll give him a shot. You know, the other thing, the other reason why they might say that as well is that I may have actually subbed out or dipped <coughs> out a gig to them. I may have given them a gig that I can't do. That is a really important thing. You know, yeah. people are, if you get an amazing gig and you're like, I can't do it, you're going to give it to somebody that you know because it's really valuable. But if, you, if somebody gives you something and yeah. you're like, wow, that gig was amazing, I really appreciate that. When the phone rings, absolutely, that's like a really key part of the way the exchange happens. Absolutely. People don't really well, talk about well, it. Yeah, sort of like, so I'm depping gigs to Jeff, then yeah. he de- deps one back. I'm like, whoa, this guy's cool. Uh, even I love if this you're guy. not doing the gig yourself, it's a token. It's worth something. It's valuable. It's absolutely worth something. That you something, have access yeah. to give that to someone else because you Killer story about this. I'll, I'll keep it short. Um, there was a a keys player in London who is really, really highly regarded. Now. Yeah. He's doing a yeah. lot of the big West End shows down there. Mm. Um, and he's actually from, he's from, um, he's from Eastern Europe, I think, sort of like okay. Poland or something like okay. that. When he moved to London, he's, he's a killer player, right? Mm. So he, he started getting gigs pretty fast. He, every single week, he depped, say he's got mm. like sort of like seven gigs in that week, mm. right? Every single week, he used to dep one out, give it mm. away. Mm. To what and he, what he'd do That's is a great strategy. It's a great strategy. Yeah. He'd give it away to yeah. who do you, who do you give it away to? The best and the busiest players mm. with all the gigs. Mm. You know. So instantly he's building that relationship. Hey, and and I, like a friend of mine knew him and said when he first moved over, because we were talking about it, he said he didn't have any money. He mm. was like doing the same thing as everybody else, scratching around trying to make a living. He needed that gig he was giving away. Mm. He needed that money, but he knew that the by getting the investment in the relationship, giving those gigs away. You know, he'd work out, you know, I'm going to do six gigs this week, that seventh gig, I'm going to give it away to build a relationship with them players that that tear up, that are getting the great gigs because I want to build that relationship and I want to be in that circle of people. So, Scott, we've talked a lot about the different routes and pathways that people can take. How would Sean go about deciding on, on the route? I mean, for me, it's kind of, I don't know, well, you've said actually that you think a really good way to start would be getting in, in front of bands. I do, like, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's just, okay. uh, well, I think another thing is just like take everything when, you, when, you, when, you well, first, yeah. when you're trying to get in the door just take everything it's not like you'll be offered 20 gigs and you can only have time to do five I've done everything I used to do everything people used to be like why are you doing that gig it's like five quid or something which is like ten dollars or something it's nothing why are you doing that gig and I was like because I might meet somebody great on the gig that I might get something great from and that happened time and time again it just it's it's just that is what happens you know take maybe when you're further down the line you can pick and choose what you want when you've got yourself self established but them gigs don't, you know, just just go for it. Make the contacts, and then and then you know, and mm. you'll, you'll you'll grow your reputation. Um, Simon Little, who the podcast is coming out next week, yeah, uh, was the bass player. Is the bass player for the Divine Comedy, which was a huge band over here in mm. the UK and mm. Europe. Um, he got that gig because he said he got offered a really terrible pantomime gig. Mm. He said it wasn't even a. He said it was like for an amateur dramatic mm. pantomime. He said it wasn't mm. a professional thing. He was in the Guildhall, mm. um, studying down in London, which is a really prestigious music school over here in the UK. And, and Simon was in in that, and he said, you know, same as everybody else, didn't have any money, needed to pay the bills. He said this gig came up, and he was like, you know what, I'm going to do it. You know, mm. it was a pantomime. It wasn't the music he was into. Mm. It wasn't professional or anything mm. like that. Um, went and did it, and then the drummer on the gig. Mm was like, hey, you know, mm. I've got this, this this gig that I'm doing. It's for mm. a band called The Divine Comedy. Do you want to audition for it? I don't even know if he auditioned. I think he might have just got the mm. gig. And he, he just put his name forward for it. Hey-ho, suddenly Simon's on tour around the world doing that. For years he did that for. 
Um, and it came from, you know, that tiny gig that it, it would have been so easy for him to knock that back. Um, Sean is also asking about whether you had to go to music school. And one thing I'd say that uh, about this cause the, is that really people judge you on how good you are as a player. You know, you need to give Absolutely, them the, you yeah. need to give them the opportunity to judge you by playing in front of them or by the means that we spoke about previously. It really doesn't matter whether you go to music school or not. What matters is how well you can play. Yeah. In but, terms of skill set, yeah. it, there is a, a bit of a but here. But the one thing going to, or two things that music school will give you is one, it will give you an amazing network to 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 work within. Everybody talks and about that. Exactly, yeah. that's the key thing that it gives you. Really, and the other thing it gives you is it opens the door to teaching gigs, which is a separate kind of conversation that we'll probably talk about in another time. And most players at some point in their career will teach pretty much everyone I'd say and what it will do is it'll mean that you can get back into the institutions you know of course you can teach privately you can set up a website you can do whatever Um, but if you want to teach at like high-end music colleges you'd probably be expected to have you know certain qualifications and things um, so moving on, Scott. This is a, so. Yeah. It's, oh, sorry. The last question is: Have you got any advice on how to make this transition? So, well, I think we've we've, we've covered, done it, we've covered we, a lot really? of stuff yeah. there. But I also wanted to think: What happens when you get the gigs? Go on, let's know, there, there is that. some stuff. Yeah. Thoughts? Let's finish, let's wrap up on that. When you get the gigs, what do you have to do mm. to make sure you keep the gigs? So, and this is sort of like bass playing aside. Let's forget about bass playing yeah. for a minute because okay. you need to be able to know all the styles and you need to take care of business. Well, mm. you know, you really need to be a really cool guy to hang around with, mm. you know. So social skills are really important. They just, you, they you know, just one are. thing about, about that that I was going to mention earlier, in terms of getting a gig from somebody, it needs to be really easy. If I've got a gig, if someone asks me to do something, I can't do it. And I go to the effort of asking somebody else, I want them just to make it easy. I don't want them to be hassling me about, you know, all sorts of nonsense and stuff. I, they need to be, people want to get rid of work quickly and yeah. not have any hassle. And that comes down to having good communication skills and, you know, being cool to work with. And, Absolutely. you know, like you don't, you won't recommend someone who you thinking might be a bit sketchy. I can think of a, a, like several really great bet players, probably better players than I am, who I can't, you know, wouldn't give work to because they're just too sketchy. And I know they'd cause a problem like they turn up to the gig without a key bit of equipment or whatever. Or you not know. dressed correctly. Yeah, or, exactly. All the stuff that's just so easy to get right. And you don't need to be told about that, you know, you just do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, You've got to be super, Super reliable. And a cool person to hang out with. And a really cool person to hang out with. You need to get there. If you're told to get there, if like the gig's at, I don't know, like 9 p.m. and you're told to get there for 8 p.m., well, get there at quarter to eight. Be Mm. early. You know, just Mm. like on time is 15 minutes early to whenever you're supposed to be there, you know. Mm. And, And equipment as well. Just come into it. Have dependable equipment and have spares. You know, mm. have a tuner. I know mm. that sounds stupid. Like I've, I've been to gigs where people haven't got tuners. I'm like, ah, oh, and the keyboard player's doing this. He's playing the middle, you know, he's playing whatever. He's playing the G, you know, the drummer sound checking, the, the bass playing, the guitar player. Mm. It's just like, it's not on. Um, so just have dependable equipment, have spares, like have spare batteries, have spare leads. Don't forget your strap. Mm. You know, have one that lives in the case. Um yeah, don't give... Go if give, you've got an active base, have spare batteries. Don't make other people's job hard, you know. Don't turn up without an extension cable because you're going to need one if at some point. You can, yeah, you know, All that kind of yeah. stuff that's just really, you know, will make will make your, everybody's life easier. So the main thing is that we're like, we've gone over all this stuff, but there's so many different ways that you can approach this. So please let us know your thoughts. Post below and, yeah, you know, join the yeah. conversation and let us know what you think about playing live.